will have your way by your spirit as you speak your word into our hearts. The word of God will touch us, will move us, and will move us to accomplish your will in your way. And that your goodness will be accomplished in us. Do that for your honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Waiting for a move of the Spirit of God. We've been talking about fruit of the Spirit for the last number of weeks. I took you into Galatians chapter 5. And we went through verses 22 and 23. And they tell us about the fruit of the Spirit. And today I want to share with you some verses that precede that. Because these are so very important in your life. Listen carefully to what this says. I say then walk in the spirit. Now listen to the word of God. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you wish you could. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the law means the law of sin. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law of sin. Now the works of sin or the flesh are evident, which are adultery and fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Isn't that interesting? you have personal issues, dissensions and things such as that along with murder and all of the other things. God doesn't look at one any different than the other. It's sin in his eyes. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in past times, that those who practice, now I want you to see the word practice there because that's an interesting word in the Greek. It means an ongoing thing. If someone has a problem or an issue or an outburst or something happens, that doesn't mean you're practicing that. You're not living that way. Because what Satan wants to do is destroy your life and the way he destroys you is you will have an issue happen, something will take place and you'll do the wrong thing and you'll look at it and you'll say, whoa, that wasn't right, I shouldn't have done it. And you know that, so you go to God and you ask forgiveness and you ask him to forgive you and to cleanse it and the Bible says if we confess our sins, then he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that's written to you and I as Christians. All right, that's very important. But we practice. If people practice, then those people who practice are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. I know they're, they're tough words, aren't they? But here's what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's the opposite of that. It's love and joy and peace. And it's long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control because against those things there is no law. The law of sin can't even begin to stand against those particular things. Many, 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 many years ago before the turn of the century, a gentleman wrote these words. <clears throat> Listen to them carefully. He said, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Wean it from the earth and through its pulses move. Now listen carefully. Stoop to my weakness, mighty as thou art, and make me love thee as I ought to love. Here's what happens. When God moves upon your heart through the Spirit, you're going to start loving God. Listen. Have you not bid us love thee, God and King, all, all thine own, soul, heart, strength, and mind. Then he says, I see thy cross. There, teach my heart to cling. Oh, let me seek thee, and oh, let me find. Verse 3, teach me to feel that you are always near. Teach me the struggles of my soul to bear, to check the rising doubt, the rebel sigh. Teach me the patience of unanswered prayer. Teach me to love thee as thine angels love, one holy passion filling all my frame. The baptism of the heaven-descended dove, the Spirit, 
my heart an altar, and thy love the flame. Is the flame of the Holy Spirit of God burning in your heart today? Is it really? Do you know what it really means to have a tremendous and wonderful visitation of the Spirit of God? As I read my Bible, I discover some things, and there are eight things that have to take place. Very clear in Scripture, before the Spirit of God can move upon us. Because you see, you're a work of God in progress. He's working with you and me every single day. He's working with us, endeavoring to change our heart, endeavoring to change our mind, endeavoring to do what? Make us more like Jesus Christ. That's the goal of the Spirit of God. This is not going to happen overnight. It's a gradual change. But I thank God that the change takes place. Does anybody else in this place thank God that the change takes place? How many of you have experienced a change in your life, a change in your heart, and you're experiencing it on a gradual basis? You're growing in the Lord. That's what it's all about. God talks about a walk with Him, one step at a time. Once in a while we stumble and we trip, but we get up and we keep walking, don't we? God talks about growing in Him. Growth takes time, but you're a work of God in progress. Now eventually, the signs that you belong to God begin to become evident. People start seeing it. Your family starts seeing it. Your church starts seeing it. Your pastor starts seeing it. Others see that the work of God is so evident in your life. And then everything that you do and everything that you say, it begins to reflect Jesus Christ. I sometimes wonder if we stop and think, what would Jesus have me to do? Once you allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life and have his way, producing his fruit in your life, then he's going to begin to show you his gifts. Now we're talking about gifts, but I can't go into gifts until we talk about the moving of the Spirit of God in our hearts. Because God wants to move on this place. God wants to move by his Spirit in this place. And when God moves in by his Spirit in this place, some things will happen. And we need to be tuned in to what his word says as truth is going to happen. He's going to give you gifts. He's going to show you things that you can use for his honor and glory and praise. And before we can do this, before we can allow the Spirit of God to examine our being, to show us the gifts, to move upon us, we must allow God to move in our hearts. And it's through his word, by knowing what God says to us. How to prepare yourself for a move of God. Write it down. Let's get ready for this. Let me give you eight things. And yes, I can get through them in 22, three minutes. You watch me. Here's what God wants to do. And let me share these things with you. Eight things have to be present before we're going to see a genuine moving of God among us. These eight things have to be present. Now, when I share these things with you, you need to understand something. I do not answer for you. <clears throat> do you hear me? I don't answer for you. And you know what? You don't answer for me. I answer to God, and you answer to God. And we each stand before God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We each stand before Him as a Spirit examines our life, and we stand alone. I answer to God. Now, if God is going to do things collectively in this church, then we have to see God moving. And the only way we see God move is we have to be unified. In order to see a moving of the Spirit of God, we must be in unity. And when we say this, people say, yep, I agree, that's what we ought to have. Ought to have unity. Everybody ought to be one. You know, basically, it says in Acts chapter 2 that the disciples, listen carefully, we're all in unity in one place. Now the Bible says that they were driving a Honda. <laughs> yeah, the Bible says they were driving a Honda. It says they were all in one accord. Oh, you knew that was coming. <laughs> but at least you're going to remember when I talk about the disciples in a Honda, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> 
There was unity. And let me tell you what. What were the disciples going through at this time? Let me tell you what they were going through. They had gone through terrible, difficult problems. They were living in, 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 a, in a position where they didn't know what was going to happen next. They watched Jesus go to the cross. They watched him die on the cross. They watched him go into the grave. They watched him. They watched all of these things happen, and they said, what's coming next? And so the day of Pentecost came. When God began the church, he put the church together on that day. Now, Pentecost was a celebration of the Jews, and people had come from many, many different lands to this place of Jerusalem, and they were gathered there. And when the disciples stood up to speak, they stood up to speak in their own language. Are these men not Galileans that speak to us? How is it? It's in Acts chapter 2. I hope you have your Bibles open. Acts chapter 2. And, and, and he said, and Peter began to speak. And Peter began to preach. Now let me tell you what Peter did. On the day when the Holy Spirit came, it came through Peter preaching. The Holy Spirit of God came to the church as Peter presented the word of God. Now, they didn't have this benefit. He didn't say, all right, guys, everybody open your Bibles, and I'm going to quote some scripture. We're going to read some scripture together. No. Peter stood, and Peter gave some obscure scripture from Isaiah. How did he give that scripture from Isaiah? How did he quote these passages of scripture? When he spoke, he committed them to memory. He knew the word of God. You see, there's a key here. If God's going to move in your life, you have to know the word. And you better know the word. You better know what God says. So Peter stands up and he gives the word. And they're amazed. He's speaking in one language and they're all hearing them in their own tongue, their own dialect. It would be like if we had a Japanese person sitting over here and a Chinese guy sitting there and over here's somebody from, from somewhere in Africa and over here's an Italian and over here's a Greek. I had to get those in. And, uh, you know, all these different countries, they're from Korea and different places and I'm standing here speaking English and everyone hears me speaking in his own language. That's what happened when they stood and spoke. Peter was speaking Greek and Aramaic, he was speaking everything that was known. There were 16 different languages, and it mentions it. The Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, it mentions all of them. I'm not going to go through them. And there, as Peter speak, uh, spoke, and as he preached, he took God's word from Isaiah, and he began to share with them what happened. When he preached the word, when he spoke that, when he took those words of God from Isaiah, and God says, my word will never return void. And what, did, what happened? The Spirit of God came upon that place. They felt the move of God. They felt the Holy Spirit coming. A fire appeared on them. All of these things took place. But do you know how it happened? It happened because they were one. And they were one because they were perplexed. And they didn't know where they were going. And they didn't know what was going to happen. And they didn't know what God was going to do next. They had just experienced so many earth-shattering things in their life that they were so shaken, they didn't know what to do. You been there? Huh? Come on, church, you been there? We have people sitting right here among us right now. You're going through earth-shattering things and you don't know what to do, and you're perplexed. And God wants to move in your heart, and God wants to say to you, it's okay, I'm in control. My spirit's going to be going before you. He'll make the path straight. He'll take all those crooked things that you, life is taking you this way, and I'll straighten out your path. And I'll lead you, and I'll guide you. And my spirit will lead you into all truth, as it says in John 16. And so there must be unity. You say, why are you laboring the point of view? Because the Spirit must be here for God to move. You know, it's interesting when people say to me, Pastor, you know, I'm sorry I couldn't get to church Sunday, but I was there with you in spirit. Can I give you a little hint? Don't ever come say that to me, because you don't know what I'm thinking. You know what I'm thinking? 
I'm thinking, wait a minute, your spirit's in your body. So your spirit was there and not here. You can't be with me in spirit if you're not with me. So here we are, unity. And these guys had been so shaken and they had been so troubled. And I want to tell you something. God allows trouble and confusion to come into your life and problems and issues. I believe he allows it to bring you to the point where those disciples were. He wants to shake you a little bit. He does it to me. Why wouldn't he you? He does it to all of us. So we see him. So we stop and we look up and we say, God, I see you. Spirit of God, move upon my heart. Melt me, mold me, make me into what you want me to be. There has to be unity. And I'll tell you how there's unity. We're not going to agree upon everything in this church. Nobody's foolish enough to believe that here, are you? Come on. We don't agree upon everything. But I'll tell you one thing. God is here. The Holy Spirit is here. And God moves upon our hearts. And we are all born again. And we're redeemed. And I hope you are. If you're not, you need to get saved today. And I don't hold that back. And if you want to talk to me after church, that's the most important thing. You come right on up and we'll talk about it. And I'll show you from Scripture how you can know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior today because the majority of us in this place know Him as our Savior. But we know Him and we expect Him to do a work. The only way He's going to do a work is when you allow your heart to be changed by the Spirit of God. Mold me. Melt me. Move me, the song says. That's what God wants to do. Are you willing to be molded Melted, moved by the Spirit so that God can accomplish His will in His way. And one thing we have to agree upon here is we're moving forward for God. One thing we have to agree upon here is that people in West Carrollton in this area, Miami Township, need to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. And you're all hung up on your own little things and your problems and your issues and fighting with people and doing things and going through things, having family problems, all those things. They have you so perplexed and so underneath the circumstances and God's saying, hey, I want to use you. Hey, I want to do something with you. Hey, listen to me. Hey, look up here. I'm trying to move. I'm trying to do something. And you're caught up in yourself. Well, I've been there. It's a natural thing, you see. That's our nature. I told you last week that God takes those holy things that he gives to us and he puts them into this frame. And he knows we're human. And he knows that we're going to fall. But it's those who practice those things that scare me. You know, you come to me and you say, hey, I fell, I made a mistake, I did something. That doesn't bother me. I said, you ask the Lord to forgive you? Good, I'll pray with you. God will just forgive you. And let's just get it over with and move on, okay? It's done. And we move on with Christ, but don't keep practicing them. When is God going to melt our heart? When is God going to change us? When is God going to send us to an altar? When is God going to bring us to our knees? When is God going to change us? That's what has to happen. There must be unity. Secondly, you must hear a sound from heaven. Number one, your pastor has to hear from heaven. When I stand before you, I don't stand here giving you my words. I give you the words that God has given to me through the week. He prepares my heart to prepare your heart and to bless you. Secondly, we as a church need to hear from heaven. We need to know that God is moving in our midst. We need to know this. We need to feel this. We need to know this. We need to sense the presence of God here. We need to know that God is with us. We need to come into this place and worship Him and find what it means to truly worship the Lord. I want to tell you something. Listen, worship is not for you. It's not for me. Worship, get it, is a service. Why do you think we call this a church service? Do you think they just pulled that word out of the air? No, because the original language teaches us. Listen, when God wrote the word, when God wrote the Bible, he teaches us that worship is a service to God. I am serving God by worshiping him. 
and I have to worship him. It says to me in, in, in John that God is looking for people who will worship him seriously and in truth, honestly and in truth, forthrightly and in truth. God's looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what he wants. So God wants you to hear from heaven. If you come to church and you sit here and you get up and you go out and you haven't heard from heaven, God hasn't spoken to your heart. You don't feel that God moved upon you by his spirit, then there's something wrong. You must be filled with the spirit. You must be filled with the spirit. You see, a glass is half full or half empty, right? <laughs> God wants our lives to be filled. And he doesn't want you to be filled with self. He doesn't want that. Come on. Do you think God wants you to be filled with yourself? No. Because where self rules, as he just said, there's all kinds of problems and issues. But where the spirit rules, then there's peace and joy and love and the word of God and the work of God moves forward. He tells us to be filled. The only way to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit, notice that means continually, is to set some time each day. And I keep challenging you to do this, and I sure hope that it's going to hit one or two of you and today and some, you know, you'll, some will, will gain from this. You need to spend some time with God every day. And I know we can do it in our cars, and I know we can do it in various places. But listen, three things. We talk about reading our Bible and praying. You better worship God, too. You need to worship God while you're doing that. Listen, Ephesians 5.18 says this. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. All right, we're getting a picture here. He's not telling us that it's a sin to drink wine. You can think whatever you want to think. But he says, don't be drunk with wine because that's excess. What happens when a person drinks too much wine? What happens? Well, they lose control, don't they? You ever see a person that has too much wine? Can't stand up straight, can't walk straight, can't talk straight, can't think straight, can't act straight, can't do anything straight and right. So he says, you see, there's a picture here. The wine controls a person. So he says, you don't have to be controlled by something, some other substance or some other thing, but be controlled. The word, the word filled by the Spirit means to be controlled. And it's under continual controlling is what it means. To be filled by the Spirit means to be controlled by the Spirit. Sometimes we're out of control. Why? Because we're not controlled by the Spirit of God. And then he says, when you're controlled by the Spirit of God, you're going to speak yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart, and you're going to be happy, and you're going to feel the presence of God, and you're going to get excited about what God can do, and you're going to be touched by His love, and God's going to do great things for you. The word or the world must see something different. These, th these elements aren't here. Forget it. The world must see something different. I was very blessed yesterday to talk to people as they were sitting there having breakfast with us. And it's amazing how many people come into this church and they sense the love of God. They sense the presence of God. And yesterday, somebody drove by and stopped in and said when they walked in the door, they sensed something different they had not sensed before. And God moved upon them in a very special way. They must see diff something different. The world has to see something different. Listen, you can go join a club. You can go join some service organization. You can join some, anything you want to join. You just go join it. But if you're going to be a part of the church, you better represent me properly out there. Yeah, I better represent you properly out there. I'm your pastor. It's important what people see in me. It's important that I'm out there doing the will of God, the work of God. It's important that I'm loving people and helping people and doing for people. And that's not just my job, that's your job. And most of all, we talk about one another. Most of all, 
God must be pleased with what we're doing. The world has to see a difference in us. And we can talk change, but let's let the world see the change. I'll tell the world that I'm a Christian. Tell them, it's a wonderful thing to tell them, but show them, they have to see a difference. Church leaders must have the support of others. Everyone must be in support of our church leaders in this place. You all know who's leading the church. You know there are lots of people in here that are involved. And we need to support one another. And we need not to worry about those people being perfect because they're going to slip up and they're going to have problems. They're going to have issues too. But we have to support one another. Acts 2.14 gives that very clearly. We must support one another. Very important thing. The Word of God must be taught. The Word of God must be taught. How important it is for the Word to be taught. I told you earlier when Peter stood before those 3,000 people, or when Pe Peter stood before all those people, and 3,000 people came to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, the greatest event in all of history, other than Jesus dying on the cross, was when 3,000 people, plus women and children, there were 3,000 men saved, plus women and children were saved. So there could have been 5,000 people saved that day, easily. Why? Because they listened to the Word of God. And Peter stood up and he quoted the Word. And he said, this is truth. He put his neck on the line. He told them what God said. They could have just killed him right then and there. And I know there were many of them wanted to do it. They'd have come after him in a heartbeat. Didn't want to look bad. They thought they'd get him later on, and they tried. But the Word must be taught, and it's very clear. If you don't know the Word of God, if you don't take time to learn the Word of God, and I want to tell you something. I have 52 Sundays to teach you the Word of God. I have about 30 minutes every Sunday to teach you the Word of God. I have 26 hours a year to teach you the Word of God. I'm going to take two weeks vacation. Oops, down it comes. The hours. The time I have to teach you the Word of God is about 25 hours in a year. You can put that in a thimble. Don't think you're going to get the word just from me. You need to be in the word every day. And my time is very limited to teach you, but I'm going to teach you. Teach the word of God. So shall my word, listen, here's what it says, Isaiah. God says, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return void, but it shall accomplish what I please. I'm not here for you to change your life because of what I say. But I'm here for you to change your life because what God is saying to you at this very moment. What the Holy Spirit is saying to you. How the Spirit of God is present and the Spirit of God is working and the Spirit of God takes the Word of God, which is what He promises to use, and is going to change your life. The world will see a difference. Your family will see a difference. And the moving of God changes us so significantly that here's what happens. Let me tell you what happens when there's revival. Let me tell you what happens when the Spirit of God moves upon a church. I've been there, I've experienced it, I've witnessed it. It's not just a happy feeling. Let me tell you what happens. When the Spirit of God moves upon a church, somebody over here is going to stand up. And somebody over here is going to move over here to the person that they won't sit next to and they won't talk with and they're going to sit down next to them. They're going to put their arm around them and they say the Holy Spirit of God is moving in this place and I want you to forgive me. I have not been loving to you. I have The two of them together will get out of there and come up here and kneel down at this altar and God will change some lives. That's what happens when the Spirit moves. I've been there. I've witnessed it many times. I've seen the Spirit move. Couples will get up and go and kneel together. Individuals will go, come to the altar and pray. And people will walk out of this place with their lives changed. That's what the Holy Spirit does. God's Word's not going to return void. And you know what? You're afraid to move. You're all worried about moving. God speaks to your heart and you stand there clinching the back of the pew. No, I know the pastor's praying. He says, anybody want to come forward and receive the Lord or anybody? And well, I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to look like I'm a sinner. I don't want to look like... Listen, you better get over what you look like and let the Holy Spirit have his way. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word's going to pierce you to your very marrow. That's what's going to happen. 
even to the division of soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and is a discerner. Listen, it knows the thought and intents of the heart. I have to come into this place with a pure heart. I have to come into this place prayed up. I have to come into this place to preach the word to you and to share the ministry with you. I have to be prayed up. I don't get up out of, out of bed and just jump in the shower and run over here and say, okay, let's get everything together and let's get church started. No, 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 I can't do that. I've got to meet with God. Because if I don't meet with God, He doesn't meet with you. Come on, church. That's what happens. Number seven, there must be conviction. There's so little conviction in the church nowadays and we want to substitute conviction with everything else. We want to substitute conviction with everything else. The Bible says that when He, the Holy Spirit of God, will come, He will convict men and women of sin. Wow, talking about sin, boy, I come to church and they tell me I'm a terrible sinner. I'm not telling you anything. Let God tell you. I don't have to tell you because you already know. And if you have some issues and some problems, you ought to be convicted by the Holy Spirit of God because God is speaking and God is challenging you and you need to get up and you need to make a decision with God. You need to get to an altar and get on your knees and get some changes made. And that's what has to happen. If we expect revival and we expect to use the gifts that God has given to us and we expect things to change in this church, it's got to change with me right here in this heart. And it's got to change with you, Carolyn. It's got to change with you and you and you and everybody else. It's got to change in your heart. That's how it happens. There must be conviction. These people were so convicted, they said, what can we do to be saved? They heard the word and they cried out for salvation. God, forgive us. And they were born again. When he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. He's going to convict. And continued ministry must take place. They went from that place, praising God and singing and going from house to house and worshiping God together. And mighty and great things happened. Just read the book of Acts. And they went out of that place different because the Holy Spirit had come upon them. They went out of that place just knowing their gifts, yes, but they went out of that place ready to die for Jesus. Ready to die. And those disciples who followed Christ all died terrible deaths. Are you willing to lay down your life for the Lord? Don't tell me you want to die for Jesus when you don't want to live for Jesus. Are you willing to say, Lord Jesus, search my heart, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me. Oh God, create in me a right spirit. All those things that David prayed. Until we come to that place, God cannot have his way. And I want the Spirit of God to move in this place more than anybody wants it. I've ministered here 14 years in this church. I long to see God move. But I want to see God move in life-changing experiences. I want to see people changed like this. God moves. God bless you. This is what happens when the Holy Spirit moves in church. This is what happens. Anybody else want to come? I'm finished. Anybody want to come to an altar and pray? Anybody want to lay it on the line for God here today? You want to say, Lord, here's my life. Take it, use it. Lord, I want the power of the Spirit of God in my life. This is what we need. If God's going to move in this place, this is what we need to see. We need to see brokenness. We need to see changes. We need to see people in prayer. We need to see people accepting Jesus Christ as Savior and lives being changed. I'm going to tell you when God moves. I've experienced it. And this is how God moves. This is how the Spirit of the Lord works. Get it. Father, I thank you. I thank you for what you're doing in hearts and lives. I thank you for you taking your word and making it real to people. I thank you for speaking to people, for changing individuals, Lord, because I can't change them. and No one here can. But there needs to be change. And I pray that each one of us will allow our lives to be changed that, God, you will touch us and move upon us in a great way. 
Father, I pray that you will make me the pastor I need to be, that you will make me the person I need to be. And Father, for each one of us in this place, we will be ministering to one another and loving one another and seeing the changes come about in lives. For all you do, I'll praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.